Okay, hello and welcome everybody to today's IIED debates event uh, where we are talking all about implementing biocredits uh, and making the market work for nature and for people. Um, today's IIED debates event is co-hosted with UNDP. We're very um, delighted to be co-hosting this one. My name's Juliet. Uh, I am the events officer at IIED and I'm going to be kind of behind the screens um, today providing some, some technical support. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we are really excited about the speakers that we have um, and about the discussion that we've um, got planned ahead of us. We've got uh, 75 minutes together. So I hope you're sitting comfortably. I hope you've got a, a tea, coffee, or some kind of refreshment ready to go. Um, I'm now really happy to hand over to Paul Steele, um, who is the Chief Economist in IIED's Shaping Sustainable Markets Group and our moderator for today's discussion. Paul, over to you, please. Right. Well, thanks, Juliet, and welcome everybody to what we hope is going to be a really exciting discussion about what's an important emerging uh, instrument uh, in the um, panoply of uh, incentives to uh, address uh, nature finance. Um, as Juliet said, we've got 75 minutes, an hour and a quarter, so, uh, so please, uh, we hope you can stay till the end when we'll be having some time for questions from yourselves and discussion. Uh, also, as Juliet said, and I think some people are already starting to do that, please introduce yourselves in the chat so we know uh, all about our participants joining us from hopefully from all over the world. I just see uh, we've had some uh, countries come up from, uh, from Indonesia, there's a participant, uh, um, so that's great. Um, uh, just from me to say that uh, um, my colleague will be introducing the concept of uh, biocredits in a moment. The way we see them is very different from offsets, which you may be more familiar with. And uh, my colleague Anna from IID will be explaining uh, it, what that means. Uh, we have a great set of panelists. Uh, we've got uh, Anna from IID, uh, my colleague. Then we've got three biodiversity uh, credit developers, Mariana from uh, Terrasso in um, in Latin America, Alex, who works Operation Wallacea and a number of emerging projects all over the world, and then Simon uh, from Value Nature, who's working in, in South Africa and, and elsewhere on biocredits. So a really interesting set of um, biocredit developers. Then we have two discussants, one Pauline from EcoTrust Uganda, who's been working with carbon credits for some time, and will share her experience of, of really getting the money down to where it matters on the front line of people managing biodiversity and how biocredits can learn from the carbon credit experience. And then Maxine from UNDP, who's uh, uh, an, an, a senior nature economist from UNDP, who will be sharing UNDP's interest in this emerging instrument. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to invite Anna to kick off with a short uh, seven minute presentation, just introducing the concept and some of the key uh, issues. Anna, please. Okay, perfect. I can see that. I hope everyone can as well. Yep. yep. Um, yeah, so as Paul said, my name is Anna Jukra and I'm a researcher at IID. And before we get to the panelists, I'm just going to run through um, broad overview of biocredits and how they can create incentives for inclusive biodiversity conservation. Next slide, please, Julia. Okay, so starting first with what are biocredits? They're a coherent unit of measurement to track conservation actions and outcomes that can be bought and sold to invest in biodiversity improvements. And as Paul mentioned, there's an important distinction between offsets and biocredits where offsets um, are tracking damage that's been displaced, biocredits track a positive gain in biodiversity. Next slide, please, Julia. So over through looking through different um, market-based conservation schemes, we found some challenges that do apply to biocredits. So first there's a stigma with for-profit investment. There's also a mixed record of offsets like we both mentioned. Um, there's also an immature market for conservation schemes, which goes hand in hand with a lack of regulatory um, and policy framework. And then lastly, there's ex excessive transaction costs as well as it's quite costly to measure biodiversity. Um, luckily, these costs are going down with improvements in technology, which we'll get to later and our panelists will also touch on. 
Next slide, please, Julia. Perfect. So um, through analyzing biocredit schemes, um, research at IID has found that if there's four key components for a successful biocredit scheme, the first is that they're simple, transparent, and cost-effective. And then it's also key that parallel to a biocredit scheme, there's enabling policy from the government. It also requires market engagement to attract buyers and generate sales. And then lastly, but not least, it, um, it's key that the biocredit scheme has inclusive and fair benefits for all parties. So in terms of looking at different biocredit schemes, they have a lot of differences, but we've identified three ways that they differ and we're gonna um, use those as a point of entry for analysis today. So the first is um, they differ in the way that they identify and measure biodiversity. They also can be different in how they set prices and they're different in how they share finance with local households and also sometimes how they define the local households or what, what really is a local level. So starting with identifying and measure bio, measuring biodiversity, there's kind of two broad ways to do this. It can be based on species abundance, or it can be an area-based measurement um, using key habitats. As mentioned, there's new tools emerging for measuring biodiversity, like remote sensing and bioacoustics, which um, our panelists will get to more today. And then in measuring biodiversity, it's key to look at how we're valuing nature, um, if it can be expanded on from just human perspective, it's hard to get from the untangible value of nature to a price tag. And that leads us to the next point of entry, which is setting prices. So most biocredit schemes are similar in the way that they have a baseline price to cover the cost of management um, and transaction costs. The price can differ um, depending on if there's a need for a return to investors or not. And there's usually no price ceiling. So they use the baseline price and then they allow the market to raise the price. And then lastly, they differ on how they share um, finance or benefits with local households. So providing inclusive and fair benefits to those maintaining biodiversity, the landowners or those living in biodiversity hotspots is key to the longevity and success of a biocredit scheme. Here, there's potentially a role for a third party as we'll see with Operation um, Wallacea. They use Plan B though as um, a third party kind of regular regulatory body um, and they are committed to 80% of funds to local households. So I'll leave it at that for now and I'll pass it back to Paul and um, to our panelists. Thank you. Uh, great, thanks Anna. Um, and I think a few people were having issues in the chat with um, um, sharing their messages with everybody. You should be able to go to the drop down menu and click on it to everyone. Uh, if you can try and do that, uh, maybe Juliet can put some e explanation in how to do that in the chat. Um, okay, well, thanks for that uh, overview. Now we turn to our three uh, practitioners. So starting off with Mariana um, Sarmiento from Terrasso in Colombia, uh, and she'll present uh, on how they have been uh, developing their work. And they've been going for, for some years now. So they're in, if you like, the most uh, advanced of the different uh, uh, developers that we're gonna hear from today. So Mariana, if you want to share your slides. Sure. Well, first of all, good morning, everybody, for me, and good afternoon and good evening for some for others. Um, and it's and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Paul mentioned, I'm the CEO of Terrazos. Terrazos is a Colombian company that mostly um, has focused on helping the private sector deploy its investment in conservation and restoration projects. Um, so. A lot of our background comes from, from that field. So just give me one second. Well, so today I'm just gonna talk briefly about what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, again, we are, so so the work, some of the work that Terrazos has been doing is based on developing habitat banks. And within those habitat banks, we, we create biodiversity credits. Um, at the moment, our track record, which involves more than 2,000 managed hectares um, under this 
a scheme. Um, we've we've contracted over four million dollars in biodiversity credits with the private sector for offset implementation. Um, so that's within the regulatory market, and now I know we're moving, and we are piloting the voluntary market to see to see what that would look like. So I'm going to share a little bit about what we've been doing on that voluntary market front. So just um, just to get a sense for you guys to get a sense of where we're working on right now, we have five different habitat banks in three different provinces in Colombia. Um, and at this point, it adds up to 2,000 hectares under management. Um, we are hoping to reach in the next year uh, 5,000 hectares under management. And on the right, you can see some of our key partners. Um, but two, two of them have been really catalytic in this process. The IDB Lab, um, they were they are our first investors they invested a million dollars in the in our pilot projects um you know they they are in a way the the private sector's laboratory within the idb um and it's been you know and it's been and it's been amazing because with them we've been able to demonstrate that the business model does work that there's appetite for the for the product and then with P4F, which is a UK government um, funded program, we've been working on scaling habitat banks and they're the ones that have helped us develop this um, voluntary biodiversity credit protocol. Um, so that's, so. and then those that you see at the bottom are some of our current clients. So just a little bit of background and and I need and I have to talk about habitat banks because for us we don't necessarily conceive biodiversity credits without habitat banks. Um, habitat banks are the area that is managed for conservation, um, but we're we're able to aggregate um, multiple investments from different, in this case, individuals or companies into one area, and. The difference between a habitat bank and other types of projects, uh, conservation projects, is that here we have early investment. Land is insured for at least 30 years. It's a results-based payment um, system, and we have 30 years of legal and financial assurances that make it, uh, you know, as permanent as 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 we possibly can in the case of Colombia. Um, so now, so again, a lot of, so our track record has been in the regulatory market within Colombia. We're now exploring this voluntary market. And for that, we created a protocol and we worked on it on a pilot, right? So within our regulatory market product, you know, the, it's, it's one hectare, it's equal to one credit. In our voluntary biodiversity credit, um, we're talking about about 10 squared meters. Um, why, why and how did we reach that? Um, mostly thinking about willingness to pay, how much are individuals or people willing to pay for one specific unit of something? And we got to that based on um, some what's what's out there. Um, and and then, so not just the spatial component, but also what types of activities are there. Um, also understanding that a credit and a conservation project not only needs a technical approach, but also financial and legal assurances for, for it to work. Um, we're talking that no project that is structured for less than 20 years would be able to deliver uh, and to issue biodiversity credits, um, and, and and each project needs needs to have its own monitoring protocol. Um, we developed this by working, you know, with a working group where the IDB P4F um, colleagues that that have been working in registries um, and also carbon credit 
carbon credit certifiers. Um, and, and companies that are managing marketplaces for biodiversity, for carbon offsets. So a lot of what we've come up with is the result also about of thinking, you know, what has worked in the carbon space, what hasn't worked, um, or what we think needs to be improved. But also a lot of the lessons learned and a lot of um, where we're coming from is based on the decades of experience that the United States and the regulatory markets have in biocredits. Um, there's a lot of experience there that we, that we can't ignore. So we, we, we decided on certain principles for this protocol, traceability, continuity, and permanence, technical rigor, rigor applicability. And by that we meant, you know, simple is better, especially in an immature setting. Um, additionality and complementarity, um, meaning all projects need to demonstrate additional contributions uh, and complementarity. All projects need to complement environmental planning uh, initiatives. Sorry, Mariana, just a couple more minutes. Yes. Um, so, how does that? How does um, our metric work? Or what are the main components of it? One is. Um, so the number of credits that each project can issue is based on um, how sort of how how the project or you no know, how the landscape is um, how the ecosystem where the project is taking place is classified under the IUCN red list of ecosystems. Right now, more than a hundred countries have adopt have adopted this this. Um, list or this methodology to the number of hectares and the number of hectares on their conservation activities or restoration activities um, and the amount of time you know the duration of the project as i said you know you can only issue credits if you have a project that is there for at least 20 years and then the more years you know if it's 30 years then it'll be the, the project will be able to issue more credits than, than the other. Um, then, and then credits are issued, you know, based on management milestones, but also ecological milestones. And on the right, this is just an example. Credits will be released as you're able to fulfill certain milestones, which each project will establish within its management plan um, so that all credits, 100% of the credits are released um, in the first 10 years of the project, but no project releases its credits right at the beginning. Um, so if I have, let's say a project which is worth, which can potentially, which can issue a hundred credits, um, in the first two years, for example, it will only be able to lead to re it will only be able to sell 20% of the credits if it has met those milestones and so on. If you can wrap up now, Mariana, please. And then finally, in relation to implementation costs and you know what's the price of the credit and whatnot. So for us, the value of each credit is the net present value of all the costs of all the costs over that 30 year period. Um, and and the, the reason why we're doing that is because one credit is equal to 10 square meters, right? And, and that credit is only sold once. So we need to make sure that that credit, that the cost of the credit includes all the cost of management activities. And one thing that we've done is that um, for every sale, a percentage of that sale goes goes into a wasting account. Um, so that wasting account begins to fill up, so that once we've finished selling all the credits, we have sufficient funds to manage for the long term. Um, so that's so that's 
in a nutshell what we're doing sorry if i ran a little fast um it's the first time for me explaining the explaining the the basics of the credit in english um so so i rambled there for a little bit um and just this uh this is the result of our pilot i just want to uh, mention that so far we've been able to sell um a little bit over 60 voluntary biodiversity credits um without doing a whole lot um at least not in the, on the front end in the marketing end so we know that there's appetite for that we know that there's appetite for this um and we know that it just needs to be improved and and that we need to work con collectively in it in order to be able to create high integrity biodiversity credits um so that we get the conservation results that we want great thanks Thank marianne you. Excellent presentation and apologies to rush you, but um, no, 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 um, my bad. <laughs> I, and I, I know you, you're uh, it's not your um, first language, so we really appreciate um, you presenting in English. So thank you for that. Really fascinating. And I'm sure there'll be lots of comments and questions. OK, so without further ado, we hand over to the next uh, developer, uh, Operation Wallacea, uh, Alex, who's the uh, chief operating officer and, uh, and will present their work. Alex, you have seven minutes. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'll get straight into it because um, I appreciate that time uh, is a little bit tight. Um, and so really, it, for us, the, the biodiversity credit problem um, was, was all about measurement. So the, the lack of the equivalent of a carbon dioxide mole molecule in, in biodiversity means that it's very hard for private sector to invest in biodiversity because if you can't measure something you can't securitize it then how do you realistically pay for it and so we took inspiration from the retail price index um which is if you're comparing inflation in china and england then you look at a basket of goods and what people are buying in china isn't the same as what they buy in england but you can still you can still compare those two locations because those are the things that are important in those places. So why don't you do the same thing with biodiversity? And that's sort of where the, the concept came, where you can um, develop a basket of a minimum of five metrics that reflect the conservation objectives for the relevant eco-region of an area that you want to protect or uplift the biodiversity within. Um, and that's the basis on which you can then develop biodiversity credits. So um, one biodiversity credit um, being defined as a 1% uplift um, or avoided loss per hectare in the median value of the basket of metrics. Um, the median being important because if you go for an average value, then you might have one metric which floods the others um, or particularly drags them down. So it's important to, to use a median. Um, and, and what that does then is that it potentially unlocks this you know, private sector uh, investment because it, it means that um, a you know, development bank, for example, can quantify biodiversity benefits um, in terms of, for example, a 10% improvement um, in biodiversity across your basket of metrics, which are um, relevant to that to that particular eco region. Um, and we know that there's this big sort of funding shortfall, somewhere around about 800 billion difference in terms of what was invested from the private sector for um, uh, for, for, for carbon um, on, on the climate side versus what was invested on the biodiversity side um, in 2021. And that's from the CPIC report largely are seen as due to, due to a lack of measurability for biodiversity. And so that's sort of where the biodiversity um, credit concept has come from. Um, so the Wallacea Trust, um, a, a charity, developed this working group um, where, as you imagine, any kind of working group where you're trying to define how to, to measure biodiversity was, was complex and a bit um, sparky at points. So um, we had um, groups from the you know, financial institutions, um, corporates such as GSK, um, consultancies, um, and academics as well. And when you get those sort of people in a room, then yeah, it, it can be a long and, and tricky process. But, but ultimately, agreement was reached um, through this working group about how to measure biodiversity improvements and avoided loss. And um, similarly to um, what Mariana was saying, it was seen as very important that we could piggyback on what the uh, voluntary carbon market had already achieved, because that's going to be recognizable, familiar, um, and um, sort of seen as less risky to, to the financial institutions. And so those same concepts like additionality, um, leakage, et cetera, um, are all there. And, and so that methodology um, has then been uh, finished open source and Plan Vivo um, are using it to turn it into a standard, which they're currently in the advanced stages of um, and expecting to have uh, projects 
uh, sort of new projects to be submitted from 2023 onwards. So they're expecting to have that standard um, coming out by the end of the year. Um, so broadly speaking, we're, there's, there's three ways that they're talking about it being able to issue credits. Um, ex ante uplift credits, um, which is where you would be pairing, you, know, you take a site like a, a lowland farm or something like that, where you're wanting to uplift the biodiversity. And for that, you would then need to um, compare to a site where there's a similar management practice to what you're proposing um, for a, a given and known period of time. Um, and you can then predict forward the likely biodiversity uplift. So that, that's one way of potentially issuing credits ex ante. Um, you've then got things like ex post biodiversity uplift, where you're measuring your, your biodiversity across your basket of metrics and then remeasuring in a, let's say every five years and issuing credit on the back of your percentage uplift. And then there's also ex post avoided loss. So that's a, key, uh, a way of potentially getting funding into sites where there's already very high biodiversity value, but there's an imminent threat to that biodiversity. Um, and so by that, you then need to pair your site or have a, a paired development site um, where you've got a site that is uh, effectively sort of what your site is likely to become if you don't um, intervene, if you don't um, sort of undergo your project. Uh, and so then you can compare those two um, locations in order to generate the um, to generate the loss avoidance for biodiversity. So those are sort of the, the basic principles of it. And, and if we look at some examples of how you what, what your basket of metrics might look like, um, I'm going to give an example of lowland English farms and Indonesian coral reefs because they're completely different eco regions. If you're doing sort of lowland English farms being rewilded, you might look at things like the off the shelf DEFRA biodiversity metric, very much habitat based. Um, look at things like invertebrates, um, species richness and abundance in the soil, um, as well as richness and abundance for total invertebrates, um, because if you, you can combine those two things and also give rankings and importance to the, um, to the species that you're finding. So you can use things like IUCN rankings as well. Um, then things like breeding birds too. So you've got very different um, potential metrics in there. To, if you were looking at a coral reef, where you might look at coral cover using video transects, um, eDNA, um, video transects for um, herbivorous fish, um, and so on. So you can then um, get to the back of metrics, but the, the, the point being that they're completely different, but that they are relevant and important for the eco regions that you're wanting to protect in each of those cases. In terms of actually getting credits, then of course there's an application process analogous to the, the voluntary carbon market, um, where a project developer would need to submit an application where there'd be an initial basic review from Plan Vivo um, or your credit verification agency. Um, they can then look at the appropriateness of your basket of metrics. They can look at the, um, the suitability of your reference sites um, and provide some feedback on that. And if that's accepted, you can then go on to the full application process. Where you've got um, at least two independent experts in the eco region that you're wanting to, uh, to, to work in that can then um, sort of feedback to you uh, in order to sort of get, get, that, get that full application process done. Um, and so then the process of actually getting the credits, well, then you need to do the measurement and that can be you know, quite labor intensive, of course, but producing a biodiversity measurement report. So that's where you're measuring your biodiversity across your basket of metrics, at least five taxa, um, taxa groups um, at time zero, plus in your um, paired development or reference sites as well. Um, and it's really important there, we're thinking about how verifiable your data is, uh, and say so there's, there's sort of restrictions and um, guidance as well, and something for the verification bodies to think about um, is, you know, for example, looking at sample when they're doing audits, looking at samples um, of, uh, of any digital data. Um, if you've got photographic evidence, um, if you've got eDNA, then there'll be lab reports. So there's various ways of, of actually making sure the data you're collecting as much as possible is going to be verifiable. So it stands up to reason and, and reduces risk for anybody that was and producing or, or funding projects like this. Um, so how how does it, how do how can we actually get money in to biodiversity through this? Because ultimately that's what this is about. Um, so I've, I've just sort of put a, a project example here. Um, and uh, much as sort of Mariana mentioned, then you've effectively got your um, you've got your sort of your your, your costs um, and you've potentially got um, your revenues as well. So. Um, if we're doing this is an example for rewilding in the UK, where your your revenue can be generated through biodiversity credits and through carbon credits, because you're going to have uplift in both. Um, but you've also got things like ELM payments as well for rewilding. 
And so that can produce, you know, produce some revenues for a project, which you then will offset, as with any business model, um, against your cost over a period of time. So that might be payments to stakeholders, might be payments to landowners um, for change of land use. Then you've got management um, input, management cost protection services, um, the legal cost administration, those sort of transaction costs, as well as your verification and issuance costs to, uh, um, to a, um, a credit agency. Um, and so, as with any business proposal, you have your revenue, you have your costs, um, and ultimately that makes it something that is potentially investable. So it might be that you have a, um, a, a private sector organisation that wishes to um, have a, a net nature positive target met by a certain year, um, and this is a way for them quantifying that impact or quantifying, sorry, that, um, that biodiversity uplift. But it may also be that you have a straightforward investment opportunity, um, and because we know that there's a lot of um, organizations that are interested in green finance um, investment opportunities and so with something like this then they're, they're, that opportunity um, is potentially there because the price that you sell your credits at of course will determine the revenue generated from the project so um, it's, it's a means of, of a sort of unlocking that those, those financial flows that's what we're really interested in um, we've um, had um, sort of the first batch of carbon credits now um, being purchased by major international banks um, on a, a large project that we're running. Um, in fact, uh, Tim, the uh, reason he's not here, Dr. Uh, Tim Coles, um, is that he was uh, invited to a meeting with the Honduran um, Minister for Forestry all about how um, we best ensure that, that private sector financing um, in, a, in a sort of a long term basis um, is it's getting to the right people on the ground um, in Honduras and other countries as well. So, um, so there are really exciting opportunities there. Uh, so that's um, all from me. Um, I hope I wasn't too long, uh, Paul. Uh, great, Alex. Um, I think you slightly overran, but uh, like Mariana, you had a lot to say. And again, I'm sure there'll be lots of comments and questions. So uh, our final developer is Simon Morgan from uh, Value Nature. Uh, so over to you, Simon. You have seven minutes. Thanks. <clears throat> Alex, if you could stop your screen share, then I can thank you. Hi everyone, thanks um, for this opportunity, Paul, and um, everyone from IIED. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Value Nature's biodiversity tokens, which are non fungible tokens um, developed uh, with proofs and validations on a distributed ledger technology like the blockchain. Um, <clears throat> and these tokens um, that we developed represent the protection of one hectare for 10 years. Um, and so that's an important departure from some of the other um, credits that you've been hearing about, um, which are focused in on the gains of biodiversity that are made. Um, what we're trying to do is drive um, biodiversity finance into the protection of biodiversity um, rather than the measurement of gains, which is kind of an output from the project, um, from, from the tokens themselves. So we do this. Um, by a scoring system for, for the tokens to understand what the biodiversity is on the ground. Um, so we've divided that up into the flora and the fauna. And what we're interested in is for a project site, what is the status um, of the biodiversity? So we compare that to a nearby um, reference site. Um, I see in one of the questions um, that have come up, um, you know, how do we address changes in biodiversity um, with fluctuations of, of seasons and, and rainfall, rainfall and things like that from one year to the next. But by comparing it to a reference site nearby that's going under, under the same kind of climatic envelope, we'll be able to, to account for that um, and to be able to measure those changes accordingly. So once we've got a, a score of the biodiversity in an area, which we use um, earth observation mechanisms for the flora um, and for the fauna, we're using bioacoustics and camera traps. Um, so kind of ground metrics um, out in the field. Um, and the tools that we're using are to try and reduce the need for um, experts um, to be out in the field, but rather using um, local uh, ecologists, um, field rangers and the likes who can deploy uh, camera traps or bioacoustic devices um, to listen in or to see across the landscape and to see what's happening. And then, as I said, from a flora perspective, using earth observations um, so that we don't, again, have that uh, bottleneck which occurs when you're trying to get uh, professionals um, out into the field, uh, which we see happening in the carbon market, for example. Um, so we try to step back and rather use technology um, answer those questions for us. So once we've got the, the biodiversity score, which is essentially the status um, from one to the next, um, 
we have weighting factors which we put against each of those. So for the flora, we're using carbon um, and we've incorporated carbon because we understand uh, the value of carbon in our systems, um, but we also recognize that biodiversity really underpins a lot of the carbon that's hap that, that exists out there. Um, but through the current carbon mechanisms, there's no real way to value the standing stocks of carbon that exist out there. Um, so again, not looking at the additionality component, but rather looking at the standing stocks um, of carbon. So we've included that as a weighting factor on the flora side. And then the IUCN has released the STAR metric, which um, assesses um, globally has assessed the area of habitat available for endangered and threatened uh, species and have come up for, with a metric for that. So we'll use that to, to weight our uh, wildlife status, our wildlife score on there. So these um, scores are then coupled together and are hashed on the Hedera hash graph, um, which is a zero carbon footprint. Um, but what's important about using um, this type of, of technology is that we are able to create the validations and proofs through our system as that data is getting hashed, um, which will really speed up the um, validation and the third party kind of as assessments of, of the data on there, as well as creating um, a sense of trust, transparency, and traceability by using um, a blockchain uh, technologies. Again, this is something that we've seen as a bottleneck in the carbon voluntary markets and, and we're trying to get around and we feel that the, um, the tokenization of the data will, will help us with that. So once we've created the, the token, um, investors are able to purchase the token and from a pricing perspective, we are costing it out on the protection of those habitats in their various areas. We recognize that to protect one hectare of biodiversity in the DRC, for example, um, comes at a very different cost than say that a similar hectare in Zambia or in the UK or um, you know Colombia or wherever else it is. Those um, that revenue that is created um, is a capital that will go into an SPV um, that is designated for a conservation landscape which runs in ten-year um, tracks. So that token represents a, that ten-year period, um, and we've identified three main biodiversity custodians that need to um, be, that need to see, receive this revenue. One is the government. Um, so this might be in the form of taxes, depending on, on which country it is. Heritage custodians or the local communities that are engaging with those environments. The land managers um, and land managers is interchangeable with land owners as is the heritage custodians. And so those revenues will be distributed by an e-wallet system, which helps with the traceability and the governance um, of those revenue flows directly to, to the um, stakeholders on the ground. And using that revenue from it um, will enable the protection of that landscape, um, driven mostly by the land ma managers or those community, community members, um, and really incentivizing the government to ensure um, greater protection and, and policies around those conservation landscapes and, and trying to extend those periods of time. From these conservation landscapes, um, you know, some of them might, from a starting point, start out at a, at a high levels of biodiversity. Some might start off at lower levels of biodiversity and they have a lot of gains to be made. Those where there are gains to be made um, are the ecological gains, which I've identified over here. And that's where the carbon credits, the biodiversity credits um, that you've been hearing and um, the other members talk about will be created. Um, the IUCN is talking about creating star units. The future is going to include water credits. So all of these gains that will come out of these landscapes that we could quantify, um, package and be able to sell will create additional rev revenue for the SPV, um, which goes back to the biodiversity custodians at the end of the day. Investors who are token holders will have access first rights. They'll be um, seen as members of that SPV, and they'll have first um, rights to purchase those carbon credits at, at discounted rates or biodiversity credits um, at discounted rates. So the biodiversity token um, essentially represents the protection of standing stocks of biodiversity and um, including carbon with, within that. Um, and then those gains that are made um, are credits that come out the other side rather. Um, I've included my email there at the bottom if, there, if there's any direct questions. Um, try to make it as short as possible to, to catch up on time there, but thank you very much. Brilliant, Simon. Thanks uh, very much for that short and concise, uh, but uh, very instructive presentation. 
So we now heard from our three developers. Before we turn to our discussions, we've got two uh, excellent discussions. We'll have our quick poll, which we should have had earlier, but, but uh, we've slightly rejigged the agenda. So maybe Juliet, if you can, yeah, put it up. So the, it's a simple question, maybe for the those on this poll, it's self-evident, those on this webinar, it's self-evident, but we want to see whether you think biodiversity credits are a good idea to reduce poverty and conserve biodiversity. So you can tick either yes or no. So we want to see if you've been convinced by our our developers, uh, you be honest, you don't have to be convinced. You may have questions still out there. So please tick. So we'll give you one minute now just to fill in the answer before we um, we uh, we hear, get the results. Great, so 87% of people think that they are a good idea and 13% are still a bit skeptical. So that's a, a, a good mix. So we've got mostly people we convinced or who are convinced already and some uh, people who are still thinking about it. And we'll come back to some of the challenges in the uh, very in interesting uh, questions that are already being asked. But uh, I want to hand over now to uh, Pauline from EcoTrust, uh, this, the executive director there, just to give her perspectives for five minutes on what she's heard. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah, so I am, uh... Pauline Nantongo Kalunda. I work with EcoTrust and we are based in Uganda. So as you can imagine, we are the suppliers of these um, uh, credits, so to speak. Uh, we exist in landscapes that are very dynamic. You have the protected areas intertwined with agricultural landscapes. And as a result, you would have a very dynamic landscape. And we have an approach as EcoTrust to to biodiversity conservation or carbon credits or whatever it is. For us, our business is about the business of landscape restoration. And as you can imagine, we need this financing to be able to engage in the business of landscape restoration. I hope I'm still there. I see people are frozen. Yes, yes, we can hear you. I haven't yeah, yeah. Off yet. No, no, we can hear you, Pauline. Okay, yeah. so yeah, so we, 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 so for, and we access these markets, as EcoTrust, we work as an intermediary, we access these markets, we need that financing, but normally, even in their simplest form, they are too complicated for us to, to be able to, to access them. And from our perspective, it explains why most people would rather they, got donor funding, do whatever bits they do, and, uh, and, and, and just implement it from that perspective. So when I listen to these presentations and an attempt has been made for um, simple, transparent, and cost-effective, that resonates with us. It, it, it resonates from, uh, with, with where we are coming from because in our landscape, you, you should be able, we, 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 it is required that you would have a landscape vision, but also a community vision, as well as a household vision. <clears throat> so for you to be able to marry all those, the interests of those different perspectives, it is important that you're coming from a perspective where the science has already demystified the metrics. It has already been worked out for you. And most importantly, broken down into practical aspects that can be understood by the people that we work with. So when I listen to the different examples and they are talking about the units and how they measure the units, it's, it's very welcome news because they've, they've come down to a level that um, is able to help us understand how to value the service that we are providing and also how to attribute it, attribute it at community level, but also be able to attribute it at um, at individual level. And also <clears throat> when it comes, normally our challenge therefore comes from the perspective of, of, uh, of the benefit sharing. So whereas uh, the, the, the price and what have you has been derived from other perspectives, from the benefit sharing, we would like to understand, are you supporting an investment 
are you rewarding environmental services or are you compensating us for, for loss? So, so first and foremost, it is important that we are not displaced in, in, in favor of biodiversity, that we, we, we are allowed to coexist. So for us, what would be um, uh, um, a preferred approach is that we are allowed to continue living with biodiversity, but then, so we are not displaced. So, <clears throat> but also even when you look at it from that perspective, for example, there is a corridor that we are working on. That's why I have the elephants in the back. There is a wildlife corridor that we are working on. And the more you conserve biodiversity, chances are you're going to escalate human wildlife conflict. So even, even when you, you reward or you support an investment, if you, if you don't leave a certain element to deal with coexistence, managing issues of human wildlife conflict, then your benefit sharing model is not, is not effective. Because even if you give me money and then I invest in, in, in restoring the landscape, the minute the elephants come back or the chimpanzees come back and they start raiding microbes, then I will retaliate. So it is very important that when you're looking at the compensation model or the reward or benefit sharing model, you're able to understand the actual drivers of loss. Is it an investment barrier? Is it um, a compensation? Is it a reward? And in most of the cases, you, you would have to, to put all those things, uh, all those considerations together. But for me, the, 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 the very message that I get from the biodiversity credits is that all the examples that we have seen are, are an attempt to add on. And, and, and for me, that add on, um, Creates, creates an opportunity where all the other things that have not been considered, for example, in carbon projects can now be addressed. Because if the carbon project rewarded increasing carbon stocks, then the biodiversity credits can be brought to, 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 to deal with the issues of compensation, for example, arising from human wildlife, cons, com, com, um, or at least in the minimum, uh, provide the diversified income streams that make managing land that way more profitable and therefore the smallholders choose it because it makes economic sense to them. Thank you very much. Great, thanks Pauline. Really important message uh, from the uh, kind of beneficiaries and we'll come back to that hopefully in the discussion. So for our final discussion I want to invite Maxime from uh, the Senior Nature Economist from the United Nations Development Programme to give his perspectives. Maxime, you have the floor for five minutes. Thank you, thank you, Paul, and thanks for uh, for the initiative. And uh, very happy to uh, co-facilitate this discussion, co-run this discussion. Um, for UNDP, biodiversity credits is actually something that we wouldn't like to miss because I think we we have signs that are telling us that the the appetite is there and the market is being created as we as we speak, essentially. Um, and even though the markets are just emerging, you know, I think that the regulatory pressure coming from global level and then from na at national levels is going to be mounting on the private sector. And so essentially, the biodiversity credits is an instrument that the private sectors can deploy in a meaningful way, one that actually could help uh, address the regulatory pressure on the one hand, but also be within the market principles, so to say, with which private sector is familiar. Uh, we, we, we've heard in the CBD discussions that the, and, and uh, we, we also heard in, in, in this webinar today that the countries, the developing countries are in need for investment in conservation from the outside. So it's quite clear that uh, trying, to, trying to leave the developing countries to solve the issues just by themselves is not going to work. Therefore, the partnership between the North and the South, if you wish, is critical. And this is probably where the biodiversity markets play out into the development context. And this is why the UNDP is, is sort of interested to, uh, to, to support this trend. Um, we understand that the market had not been mature and it is just a, a sev several transactions so far. Um, and, and these are non-fungible tokens, but ultimately I think as, the, as things develop with the regulators and as more transactions come in and as more exchange of experience comes in, and we can expect more standardization, we can expect issues that have been actually 
handled in the voluntary carbon markets to pop up and be effectively handled in this market as, as well. And as one of the presenters uh, reminded us, there's history. Uh, Marian said that they, they learned the history of habitat banking available from the United States, wetlands banking or from Australia habitat banking. So it's, it's really important to uh, be, be, you know, to, de to demonstrate it, to experiment on the one hand, but also to learn from those systems that have been out there as well as from the uh, voluntary carbon market history as well, of course, which is uh, which has lots of parallels, which has lots of principles that are similar in the case of biodiversity markets, such as permanence or such as leakage and any other principles that need to be addressed. Um, and we also look at it from the point of view of comparing it with other instruments, such as bonds, performance bonds, if you wish, and looking at the complexities, the pros and cons actually, uh, we, we see more advantages with the with the with the credits than with bonds because bonds are quite difficult. They take lo lots of time to to structure. They take sometimes exorbitant transaction costs. While here we we see a potential to have things very very close to geographies, very close to communities. Uh, we we also are happy that the emerging certifiers such as Plan Vivo, you know, they are in the game and they are putting uh, panels, review panels that help to. Uh, mitigate the risk of greenwashing, so to say, or ending up with unrealistic conservation plans. Um, same same uh, sort of approach of certification is actually uh, promoting the investment of the proceeds, at least part of it, as we learned from Plan Vivo, half of the proceeds need to be traced back into community development. And again, this is a very clear developmental issues, developmental benefit that, that plays favorably uh, towards, uh, you know, towards uh, the whole market of biodiversity credits, right? So for, for those, uh, for the, and, and of course the technology, we, we had Simon presenting on technology. So it's, it's something that lends itself to be a blockchain, if you wish. And this means that you know, with the uh, with with the, as market develops, there's a chance of actually cre creating really fun creating fungibility, if you wish, at some point. This is what ultimately a market uh, would be would be looking for. And uh, of course, uh, this is just the beginning, as I said. But I think that working with partners and having exchange uh, like we have today in the webinar, where we have cases. You know, presenting different approaches to metrics, presenting different approaches to uh, issue of the credits, but but at some point, hopefully, this is going to give us the ground for analyzing these things and creating and 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 moving towards moving the market, if you wish, both in terms of volumes, but also with respect to integrity, because ultimately, what we need we need to have products that are integral, if you wish, in in terms of conservation uh, benefits that we are looking for, but as well as uh, the 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 developmental benefits. So let me stop here and thank you again for uh, uh, for inviting you and the P to be the co-host of these. Thank you. Yeah, Maxime, thanks, and we do uh, appreciate you and the P co-hosting this event with us. Um, okay, well, we now have about um, uh, just under twenty minutes, uh, fifteen to twenty minutes for Q and A, um, and we've got some really interesting questions that have come in. I'm going to um, maybe pick three questions which uh, seem to be particularly pertinent and then invite um, particularly our uh, three developers uh, uh, to respond. Uh, that's Mariana, Alex and Simon. Uh, the first question is a question from uh, Kunari um, or Kinari uh, asking about what legal arrangements, due diligence and perhaps even more broadly government policy have you engaged with in order to develop your schemes? Um, I mean, it was made mention by Alex, I think, that um, that, that his colleague Tim is off meeting the, uh, the Honduran Minister of Forestry. So to what extent is it needed to engage with uh, legal issues and government policy to get these schemes off the ground? Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Mariana, whether you want to kick off on that one. Sure. Um, so in the case of Colombia, for example, um, Terrazos has actually participated in the development of policy at the local level. Um, for example, de defining and determining the criteria to register a habitat bank. Um, where issues such as land tenure 
uh, need to be verified, right? Um, and and making sure you know that if there is community involvement, there is free prior informed consent processes that are taking place. Um, but in, in the case of Colombia, for example, if you want to create a habitat bank and issue biodiversity credits, you will need to register the site with, um, and you register the site within the Ministry of Environment. And then once it's registered, you can sell those credits, right? And then there's an annual reporting that takes place. Um, so that's, that's one component. And I think the other component, which is just the best practice, and we've tried to document that best practice in our protocol, it's, um, you know, verifying tenure, you know, ten land tenure rights, um, and making sure, I mean, in the end, these kinds of projects will only work with the local communities, you know, they're the ones if, if, if they're not part of the process, um, the project is going to fail. You know, it, it's as simple as that. It won't, you won't be able to maintain a project for 30 years if local communities are not properly engaged. Um, we've had issues with land tenure. Um, in fact, you know, we, it was um, just a very quick story. You know, Colombia has um, some areas that have been illegal, illegally um, taken by, you know, individuals and, um, and we were doing the, the due diligence and everything was right. Everything, all the paperwork was right. Um, and then as we were finalizing kind of our pre-structuring phase, um, we began to hear some gossip around. And it's like, hey, are you guys, you know, aren't you guys scared of doing a project there? And we're like, okay, we need to stop here. <laughs> we need to stop here and really know what's going on. Um, and in fact, we, can, we put the brakes on that project um, because there were certain land tenure issues. So it's that's something that the project developers need to do and make sure that happens. And the and um, and communities also, if if somebody does suggest and does propose a biodiversity credit pro project, um, the community should also do the due diligence on that on that project developer, right? Do they have a track record? Do they have a track record? Um, What's their reputation? Who are the legal representatives? Communities also need to do that. So, so I would just say that um, again, Colombia does have a policy on habitat banks. We know that Peru is developing a policy on habitat banks as well, um, and and that's going to be instrumental in allowing this market to mature. Great, thanks, uh, Simon or Alex. Do you want to add anything on legal issues or government policy and how and how and in important it is to engage yeah absolutely i think it's an essential part of the um the initial sort of due diligence for the project um, and also the de-risking approach for any um mm -hmm. any, any any corporate that wants to invest in the in the project and um, then they're going to want to see it much in the same way as they would with carbon credits they would expect to see um that, that, that you've got a letter of approval some sort of authority from the government um to be able to uh, channel funds from achieved biodiversity lift up the sort protection um, and so that you're you know, avoiding double counting and there's some ways where, where you've got uh, approval to do that um, so yeah I, th I think it's I think it's crucial that the difficulty is, is that with the carbon market there's an established mechanism for that um, with you know, an, an established accounting um, mechanism whereas for biodiversity as of yet there isn't uh, and, and so I, I think that it's going to be more about almost not not quite the same as research permit based based, but you're, you're, there's going to need to be a, a, a sort of a, a tracking of the biodiversity um, credits that have been issued for a given area, so that so that those credits can't be issued, you know, um, again in in sort of the same area um, in the near future. Um, and so there'll have to be that retirement concept, and I think that the government will have, will will need to get involved in that if they want to see funding coming into the, to those areas, which I, I would hope that they would. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, Simon, do you want to add anything? 
I mean, I think they've, they've covered everything. I think it's important to get those um, government players in, into the room as soon as possible and, and start the thinking around biodiversity and what it means, um, as, as has happened with the carbon, and take that learning that we've got from those and kind of um, move forward with that. But um, I think the the early movers in this, um, you know, it's, it's our responsibility to start those conversations and, and to get the right people into the room. Sure. Well, if, if, if I can just say a little something on that. So um, we learned something in the Colombian policy and if there are any government officials in the room, um, you know, maybe take note here, <laughs> um, but it's, we were able to get, um, so all the requirements to register projects are in place and they work. But one of the things where Colombia felt short was it wasn't specific about the duration of these projects. So right now we have a risk that anyone could register a habitat bank um, that is, let's say, five years or 10 years, right? Although there is a complementary guidance that says that it, they're a minimum of 20 years. But, you know, there's a fine balance between government policy that sets the rules of the game, which is really important to de-risk, um, and then over over regulating and then kind of and then driving away you know investment into these kinds of mechanisms um but but including kind of uh registry requirements so what are the minimum that these projects need to have uh what's the duration of these projects and how um the accounting needs to happen are three key elements of that regulation that need that makes it easier for everybody to to play and to participate in this market great thanks um okay i want to move on to another key stakeholder perhaps the most important one which we've uh, heard a lot particularly from pauline about the uh, the 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 host communities as it were or the land the uh, the um people at the front line of managing the biodiversity who often, as Pauline was explaining, suffer from human wildlife conflict in the case of, uh, of chimpanzees or elephants or, or other kind of charismatic species. Um, can you just tell us a bit more, and some of the questions reflect this, particularly um, uh, Niak has asked about equitable benefit sharing, someone has asked about fortress conservation, someone has asked about, um, you know, selling up land to foreigners how do we stop this becoming a, a another kind of land grab um by uh by uh, speculators as it were around uh, biocredits um i don't know whether anyone wants to comment on that and make sure that uh communities really do get the uh the some of the uh the rewards yeah. and, and what kind of reward it is pauline maybe you want to just shape that question a bit more yeah, well, um, I think that it 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 is it is maybe a question or maybe a caution, and I I think I also saw a, a question which was saying that whose whose land is it or whose resources are they, and I think that um, it, it has also been partially answered. The thing is that people need to understand that we have different perspectives, that we have different perspectives. We in Uganda, for example, I do not to have. I don't need to have a piece of paper to to for me to claim ownership of a land, and and all my neighbors know where my land begins and my land stops, and we all know which land is communally owned, and 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 it's perfectly legal. So sometimes in the process of of the obsession with documentation, the obsession with understanding that uh, it's only documentation, only when documented are things legal, that is sometimes when we, when the communities actually lose their rights. It, it is it, because a piece of paper can be, you can write any name on it, or you can claim any name on it, yet really when it's not documented, then we can sit on the table and, and, and we negotiate and, and, and that sort of thing. I just want people to understand that every legal framework, th there is a process that is appropriate for every legal framework. And it's very important to understand the local dynamics and, and, and design these systems in a manner that is 
fits in this system. So it's not everywhere that you have to overhaul the, legis the, the legal framework to be able to operate. Sometimes it is in the process of overhauling the legal framework that actually writes uh, uh, um, uh, law. So, so for me, I just wanted to highlight that. So the, 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 almost every legal framework can provide a, a process of engagement and the process of attribution and therefore a process of benefit sharing. Oh, thank you. But of course, there are places where the, the legalities of things need to be clarified, but it's not always the case. Great, thanks. So Simon, over to you. Yeah, I think um, Pauline, thanks for that. And I think it highlights the value of um, local players and actors on the ground that you, you know that you need to engage with um, to understand um, some of these complexities. And so I think that that's going to be one of the issues with the scaling of some of these mechanisms um, and, and what we've seen in the carbon markets where um, you know organizations are parachuting in um, and getting involved locally um, and wrapping up carbon rights, for example, with no real understanding of, of the local complexities and mechanisms um, on hand. So, um, I think that, you know, again, some of these, <clears throat> the first players in this and, and thinking about how we scale this, the, uh, it's important to think about how we include the local actors and, and mechanisms on the ground that are going to be managing these landscapes, engaging with the local communities that are, that are often the, the ones that are managing these landscapes and ensuring that we don't kind of overstep um, and or remove some of that um, value from, from those entities on the ground. So I think engaging with, with the likes of you know, eco trust and you know whoever might be working in Uganda, or if you move to Zambia, or if you go into Colombia, you know you you got to make sure that you're engaging with those local actors because that's the only way to kind of get around it. There's there's no ways that we can come in and think that we understand some of the complexities that exist on the ground. And then from a conflict perspective, you know, it's really about just trying to drive that value um, so that conflict doesn't be, you know we go beyond the conflict by ensuring that those entities are seen are, are, are valued beyond what the conflict creates um, and and change the kind of view and the lens of, of what those and um, what biodiversity represents for, for those people living with biodiversity great thanks and, and Alex just very quickly because I have one final question I want to ask you all uh, okay sure um, yeah I would just say um, I'd agree with those those points for sure from Simon and Pauline and um, just to add that, that, that it's probably one of the most important uh, issues, one of the biggest threats to biodiversity credits is, is the, the governance around um, stakeholder benefits. Um, so uh, I, I think that, that it's where we can learn from where the, the problems that were exposed from the carbon markets. And I think that how, that how that's governed with the biodiversity credits going forward will be, will be very important. Um, but in particular, how um, you know, there, there's the risk of uh, somebody purchasing a biodiversity credit and four or five dollars goes into the local stakeholders and then um but it's then on sold for a huge markup and and, and you get you know 50 60 70 dollars um that's going to another corporation outside of, of, of so that the actual benefit isn't going into that country um but i think that, that is something that can be regulated against and i think that's where you can bring in regulators such as plan vivo or such as um you know, other other um credit bodies to, to look at the financial flows attached with biodiversity credits or carbon credits um, to, to start to mitigate that. And you have extra technologies like blockchain, um, which, which can also help provide some guarding um, for, for that sort of onward transaction sale. So um, I think it's a, a real challenge, but I think it is one that, that can be, certainly to, to some extent anyway, um, sort of audited um, so that we can, we can ensure that there is you know, proper stakeholder uh, benefit from each project. Great, thanks. And the final question I just want to ask you is um, the demand side. We've heard about the supply side, the local communities. We've heard about the role of government. Is there appetite in the private sector? I mean, Maxime alluded to this. Uh, but are you seeing real demand from private investors to buy these credits? Uh, can you share some insights into that and whether you think this is going to explode as with the voluntary carbon market? Is there signs of hope? Uh, Mariana, do you want to kick off? Just uh, so, very quickly, a minute. So each. I'm, I'm convinced. You know, I'm an optimist. Otherwise, I would, you know, I would not be working on this for the last five years. Um, <laughs> but um, so, so first of all, from a regulatory market perspective, you know, carbon, um, sorry, biodiversity credits, um, for companies that want to be, that want to offset their impacts or that they want to make nature positive statements, 
the the appetite is there. The appetite is there. The transactions are happening, right? So for buyers, we're seeing it. Um, and we're also seeing it with individuals, you know, individuals that want to purchase um, biodiversity credits that represent tangible um, conservation outcomes on the ground, something that they can imagine, that they can see, something that it's pal palpable, we're seeing it. And otherwise, you know, we would have not had, you know, the sale of those 30 voluntary biodiversity credits within a three, three week uh, window, right? So we know that it's there. Um, and we're seeing uh, also interest from investors. Um, I think investors are, I mean, they, they still, they don't understand these markets very well yet. Um, there's a tendency to compare it to the carbon market. Um, I think this is going to be different. I think the, the biodiversity credits are going to be a different beast. Um, and so even though there's a lot of interest where, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of doubts still. Um, but we're seeing, you know, we're seeing it. Um, and with companies, in fact, and, and I'm kind of combining the two, but, but I, it's difficult not to do it because, um, you know, that's where we're seeing the demand. But of our 2,000 hectares that are under management right now, I would say 70% of those credits are fully, are reserved at this point, you Great. know? And, and so, so, so we know that it's there. Right. Okay, sorry, I need I need to pass on to our other two developers. Yes. So Simon, any what is your sense of the demand that's out there? Well, I, um, I don't think we'd have 200 people sign up for this if there wasn't some kind of chatter out there um, about what's happening in the space. Um, so I think that that speaks for itself in, in a way. Um, but we've definitely had a lot of pickup um, and a lot of movement in that direction. And I think something that Mariana mentioned there is, you know, We've got to be careful of the complexities around this and try and simplify things for the for the investor community. And I think that there'll be stages um, that we go through. And that's really what we're trying to address um, with the biodiversity token is, is to just develop a mechanism for that finance to go in and for the gains to happen at a later stage and for those credits um, to come. But, but to try and simplify the process um, and just try and get the um, revenue in for the protection of the landscapes. And I think with all the nature positive calls that are happening out there and, and movement that we're really going to see um, this market um, grow rapidly um, as we've, you know, as we get these um, tokens and credits out the door. Right. And Alex, last word to you on demand. Sure. Um, um, so unlike Mariana, my, my, my work is pre predominantly financial. And so I'm a pessimist by nature. Um, and I'm 100% convinced that there's a, a very strong market for, for biodiversity credits. Um, you know, we're, we're regularly asked for them. We've um, been able to, to, to generate funding um, for biodiversity credits, even while they're still um, in the development phase. Um, and, and so I, I think there's, there, there's no doubt, um, as with ev almost every corporate purchaser of, of, of carbon credits is, is looking to be able to quantify um, biodiversity benefits from, from projects. And so I, I think that biodiversity credits are inevitable um, and that, that there is definitely a market out there for them. Great. Okay, well, with that, we have to come to the end of our webinar. So, uh, you know, we've, we've heard about uh, fascinating insights from the developers from the need, and the need to engage with government, the need to make sure the money flows to the local households and then obviously that the demand is there from the investors and the buyers. So with that, we thank you very much and we uh, please look at the recording, share the link and, um, and keep on the conversation. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.